Good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas. So our granddaughter's in town for a, a couple of days, yeah. So she'll give Ben a run for the money on the cute department. <laughs> so last night in our neighborhood, the, the fire truck comes by with Santa Claus on the fire truck. And, 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 and it's right at that time, the wind was blowing and it was snowing like crazy. And so it was like this Arctic, it was something right out of a movie, this Arctic winter wonderland with Santa walking up the driveway. And so I've convinced the entire family that I arranged for that. <laughs> so it's one of those times when uh, serendipitously I, I looked good as a, as a pop pop. We're in, uh, Acts, or we're in Luke, the second chapter. And uh, we're continuing our series uh, on the light of Christmas. That when God is going to do new things, or he's going to begin to help us win great battles, it starts with the shining of a light. And so we're in Luke, the second chapter, and it says, uh, There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Just think about that. Good news, great joy. All people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Mary uh, treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which was just as they had been told. Um, what we're learning is that darkness tends to conceal things that needs to come to light. Light reveals things, but not everything that the light reveals is something that we hoped for or wished for. There was a time in the ancient world when shepherding was actually considered a respectable vocation. That if you were a shepherd, that was considered a, a reasonable investment of your life and in the community. But when Israel had been enslaved in Egypt, they didn't have the same view of shepherding that had existed in the ancient world prior to that. They didn't have much use for sheep or shepherds, and so their view of them was pretty low. Even in ancient art of Egypt, you can see that shepherds are depicted as uh, quite disrespect, uh, respe disrespectably. And so... One of the things is that when life adds pressure to you and you are being put down, the natural tendency of humans is to find at least someone lower than us that we can pick on. It's, it's referred to literally as the pecking order, and, and so the Israelites would, even in slavery, just look down on those who were responsible for shepherding. By the time we get to Luke chapter 2, obviously... They're not enslaved in Egypt anymore. In fact, they'd had hundreds of years of national prominence, but now uh, they are under Roman occupation. And once again, people who are under difficult times want to find someone that they can look down on even more. In the writings historically around that time, one of the things that they tell us is, is that if you were a person who was basically incompetent in life, you could still do shepherding. And there's actually indications that shepherds did not have the same civil rights that other people who lived in that culture did. They were the bottom of the social ladder. 
What's interesting is that there have been a period of about 400 years when the voice of a prophet had not been heard. It seems as though heaven had gone silent. There hadn't been any visions, any significant dreams, any significant message from heaven, and then all of a sudden, it appears as though the heavens are opened in the fields outside of Bethlehem, and God chooses to speak to the people that no one else wants to. God has a tendency, I don't know if you've noticed, when you read through scripture, time after time, he consistently chooses the people no one else will choose. And for lots of us in this room, that gives us hope. So I'd like us to think about the glory of God kind of breaking into our world and the effect that it has on us and the world around us. And the first thing I want us to see is that the glory of God reveals what we lack. The glory of God reveals what we lack. I'm wondering if, if you woke up this morning and while you were getting ready for church, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared in your house and the glory of the Lord shone around you. I wonder what your reaction would be. I wonder if you would say, well, it's about time. What took you so long? I've been waiting. I've been praying. Or maybe you would just say, I knew I was on the right track. It was just a matter of time. That's not what happened to the shepherds. They weren't just confused or uncertain. They were terrified. That's a pretty strong word. Uh, I think human imagination about God is actually quite low, and very limited. And if we ever interact with the realities of heaven, it's far greater than anything we could have imagined it to be. And I think in those moments, we realize we severely underestimated God and his capacity. Before an encounter with God, we might assume that we've worked reasonably hard and tried really well. And so there are some things that ought to come into our lives, or at least some things that ought not to come into our lives. We've accomplished something. We've, we've given our best effort. The, the challenge about the glory of God is that when it shows up, it actually helps us see how inglorious the rest of our world is. That's not always a comfortable experience. The, the concept of the glory of God shining, it, 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 glory actually has two components to it. It's a really interesting word. And the first has to do with shining. Shining. So there's, there's an actual illumination. It wasn't just someone startling, you know, showing up behind the shepherds and all of a sudden they turn around and there's, there's an angel there. That, that, that's not what it refers to. There was this great light. It was, it was a different kind of light than they were used to seeing. But it also has to do with a sense of weight. It's a really interesting word. It, 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 it means light and it also means weight. I'm sure you saw this in a movie. I don't think any of us have actually done this, unless maybe you were in a class or something. But back in the day when someone was going to mail a letter, what they would do is they would write the letter, and then they would fold the letter, and then they would take a candle, and they would melt wax on top of the letter, and then they would take a seal. It usually was uh, their initial or family symbol, and they would press it into the wax, and then that identified who was sending the letter. And if you got the letter and that seal was broken, that meant somebody tampered with your mail. So how many have never done that? Okay. How many have? Let me just see. Really? Wow. You are much older than you look. That's <laughs> impressive. The idea there is that the weight of God doesn't just impress us by image. It actually presses something into us that makes us recognizable as belonging to God. That's a really incredible thing. And it's not just a light that shines and shows us things, but it's something of a weight of God pressing into us his intended purpose for us. And the glory of God invades the fields that night, and it's revealing something that matters a lot and is going to make a big difference. The world is not just going to be impressed by a light that shines. It's going to be changed forever by what God is doing. So in our world, you probably have said this, I'm sure you've heard other people say it, is that it just seems like no matter what I do, no matter how hard I try, it doesn't change this, it doesn't make a difference. What I want you to know is that 
what's actually being said in that moment is a recognition that our glory is not enough. I can bring all the weight I have to a situation and it doesn't change the outcome. I'm not enough. That's the point. And the glory of God comes because the glory of God is enough. So we, we try to create a future for ourselves in which we obtain the things that we desire, or at least don't lose the things that we have obtained. We try to exercise enough influence to control something of the circumstances around us. Uh, we, we, we try to convince people to accept us, maybe even to like or love us. And yet, despite our best efforts, we all wind up in situations where we realize that our efforts were not enough. It's an inglorious world. Our glory is not enough. And that brings us to the second point is that not only does God's glory show us what we lack, God's glory shows us what God is doing. And this is a really big deal. And what it says is that there's good news. Good news. That's very different from good advice. How many here have ever had someone try to give you good advice? Not, not all that many. How many have tried to give good advice? Yeah. And, and people just, they, they tuned you out. They turned you off. See, God gives good advice. Scripture is filled full of his wisdom and knowledge to help us know how to avoid some things that could be destructive or painful or how to lean into some things that could build us up and, and help us experience uh, life as he intended it to be. But at the end of the day, the wisdom and knowledge of God often seems beyond our capacity to understand or our ability to live out. It seems impossible to us. And when it comes to advice, a lot of people think that's all Scripture is. It's just good advice. Live like this, life will go better. And that's not all Scripture is. It's good news. Good advice says this is what you need to do for God. Good news says this is what God has done for you. And that's a very different thing. He's come into our world, and this is what it says. It says that you, he is a savior. A savior is born. That means we're not responsible to save ourselves anymore. God is coming to rescue us, and it says today. That means now. And it says nearby. Just think about that. Now and near. God is at work, and he's making a difference in our lives. This is what the glory of God reveals to us. And it not only reveals something to us about what he's doing, but how he's doing it. God does not come into our world with an army, but as a baby. This is stunning. He's completely upending our assumptions about what makes a difference in our world. What he's telling us is that the poor are not powerless, and the vulnerable are not absent of influence. It doesn't take big cities and big titles to make a big difference. A baby born in poverty and obscurity is going to change the world. And that means there's great joy. Not just a little bit of joy. Not just a giggle or a laughter. Great joy. Great joy at least for people who realize I, I don't have to save myself. If, let's suppose that you were... You, you fell off of a boat out in the middle of a large body of water and you were far enough away from shore that you weren't even sure which way shore was. And let's suppose that the water is cold and the sky is dark and the winds are blowing and the waves are choppy and you don't even know which way to swim and you don't have a life preserver. I'm imagining that you're very suspicious you might not survive this event. Can you imagine if someone came by with a boat and a light and a life preserver and threw it out and offered to bring you on? You would say, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to save myself. We would be so relieved and so joyful that help had come. And that's what our Savior does for us. And then it says, great joy for all people. See, God is not infected with the kind of bigotry that infects our world. In our world, usually good news for one group means not so good news for another group. When someone does really well, it's often at someone else's expense, or at least they're not included in it. Let's suppose that you put your house on the market for sale and you got way more than you thought you could. Good news for you. 
bad news for the person who bought it. Let's suppose you're buying a house and you got a ridiculously low price. Good news for you. Bad news for the person who's selling it. Let's suppose you got the promotion at work. Good news for you. Not so good news for the people who also were hoping for that promotion. You got accepted at school. Good news for you. Not good news for the other students who weren't accepted. You see, our world is not good at bringing good news to all people. It just brings good news to some people who seem to do better than other people. God knows how to bring good news with great joy to all people. It brings us to the last point I want to make today, and that is, is that the glory of God invites a personal response. It invites a personal response. The shepherds didn't just talk about what they'd seen. They decided to go check it out for themselves. The light in the fields had faded. The angels had proceeded on to their next heavenly assignment. And the shepherds decide to go to Bethlehem and see for themselves what they had been told. So they hurried off. They found Mary and Joseph. They saw the baby wrapped in cloths and laying in a feeding trough. And they couldn't help what happened next. They just started telling people what they saw. They were rejoicing with great joy. And the Bible says that people were amazed. And it wasn't just because this was a, an astonishing story. It was because of who was sharing it. These are not the people that God would typically use. They had little regard for the people that were bringing the very best news. In our world, sometimes God sends angels. And in our world, sometimes God sends shepherds. And we should be open to listening to either one of them. Because it's good news that brings great joy for all people. So my thoughts when I think about this kind of wind up going back to Mary and Joseph. Um, I remember how I felt when I got married. I felt like I had taken on a lot of responsibility. I made a big commitment. And I thought that was the most responsible I would ever feel in my life. And that was true until we had a child. And then the level of responsibility I felt went up by a factor of I couldn't even calculate. And here is Mary and Joseph who are staying in a stable and a feeding trough is a crib. They're not in a nice home or even a decent guest house. And it would be very easy for them to ask, where did we get it wrong? Where did we go off track? Maybe we were mistaken about all this, or maybe even worse, maybe we were misled. And God uses the shepherds to actually confirm that they're on track, that they're right in the middle of God's will, that they're sharing the story of what they saw and heard in the field and what to look for, that there's a stable and there's a feeding trough and there's a dad and a mom and a baby and it's wrapped just in claws that have been put together and that this is exactly what God intends. And this is what it says about Mary. It says that she began to ponder that information, to think it through. And she treasured it. That she's thinking thoughts she hadn't thought before. And she's finding value in things she couldn't find value in before. It's amazing what kind of thoughts we will think and where we will add value once the glory of God breaks into our lives. So the shepherds go back because sheep still need protecting from predators and the nights aren't going to get any shorter for them and it's not going to be any easier to try to stay awake all through the night. Not everyone changed their opinion about the shepherds and now held them in high esteem. But in a very real way, something had changed. Heaven had visited them. They had become eyewitnesses to what God was doing in the world. The sheep didn't change. The field didn't change but they were forever changed. So the question I have for you today 
is what might God's glory be revealing to you? If God's glory is breaking into your world, what might it show that you lack? This is not easy to accept. And by the way, this is the, one of the larger reasons and most significant reasons why people veer away from Christianity. It's because when the light shines, it shows everything, not just the good things. And lots of people are uncomfortable with that. But it also shows what God is doing. Maybe you have suspected that God is distant and uninvolved in this season of your life. My prayer is that God's glory will break into your life today and you will see today he is at work nearby. That now something is happening. And maybe there's a, a personal response you can make. Maybe there's a step you can take, a word you can speak a response that you can give that not only gives you something to share with someone else, but helps encourage others that they never knew you could be that source of encouragement to them. Maybe that's what happens when God's glory breaks into our world. Let's bow our heads this morning. I think this time of year, we tend to notice, or at least feel like we don't have enough. We all wish we had more to spend and more to give. And I mean, if you're to believe the commercials on television, when I wake up on Christmas morning and I look outside my window into the driveway, there should be a luxury automobile there <laughs> just waiting for me. But I know that's not going to happen. There's a way we get used to disappointment. There's a way where we degrade ourselves in our own eyes because of what we can't do for someone that we love a lot. Our world does a really good job telling us we're not enough. And when the light of the glory of God shines, we're convinced it's true. We see the lack of glory that we bring in our world. And if that's all it was, it would not be good news. But there is very good news. And that is there is a Savior who has been born. And he's at work right now in your life. And God's glory begins to reveal that. And that makes all the difference. So, Father, we're not asking that you shine light in a way that just makes us look good. We're just asking you to shine light in a way that reveals truth, even if it's an uncomfortable truth about ourselves, because that light will also reveal truth about you, and that is good news that brings great joy for all people. Would you help us lean into that truth today? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.